It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello my brothers and sisters, it is the Remnant Warrior, and in this video we are going to be talking about the Kabbalah. We're going to be talking here directly about the Kabbalah. I'm going to be reading some articles and reading from some books, and then we are going to watch a couple of videos about the Kabbalah. This first article is called The Land is a Ball and it's from the Living Wisdom Kabbalah website and it's very easy to see that it, it is Kabbalah and it shows where this Copernican cosmology comes from and how it does not fit with biblical cosmology says, prior to Christopher Columbus' famous voyage across the Atlantic, most people thought the world was flat with a visible edge that one could fall off into oblivion. Most people thought this, but not all. Rabbi Hamuna Saba explains further in his book that the entire inhabited land rolls around like a ball so that some are up and some are down. To wit, the creatures around the globe are opposite each other, and the seven sections of the globe are seven lands, which are the seven continents. All of the creatures of the six lands are different in their appearance according to the difference of the atmosphere in each place, and they live like any other man. That's right, the Zohar... It says written over 2,000 years ago, but the Zohar wasn't written 2,000 years ago. It's clearly stating that the world is a globe and therefore round. It also happens to mention that there are seven continents, which six are inhabited. And then at the bottom it says, let us continue. We're going to go to the next page of the article. But it says there is an inhabited place so that when there is light on some on that side of the globe, it is dark for others on the other side of the world. Thus, when it is day for one group, then it is night for the others. There is an inhabited place where there is day only and no night, save for a little while, which is Antarctica. Here, the Zohar is demonstrating its grasp of the concept of the earth spinning on its axis and revolving around the sun. This was not widely accepted or understood until the 16th century. It says some 1500 years later, but the truth is, the Zohar was written only 200 years before this in the 13th century, or the 1300s. And so this whole land is a ball teaching being written 2,000 years ago in the Zohar is a lie because it was written in the Middle Ages. But it does show that Copernican cosmology was in the Zohar and it came from 
Neoplatonism and Plato and Pythagoras and we're going to see here in just a minute in a, a book that we're going to look at that the it's called the Geometrical Kabbalahs of John D. and Johannes Kepler the Hebrew tradition and the mathematical study of nature we're going to see that all of this geometry and math magic is nothing but black magic it is satanic and it comes from the Kabbalah of Babylon it comes from the religion of Babylon and from Greece from Platonic thought and mixed with Babylonian mysticism you've got the flat out black magicians this is the geometrical Kabbalahs of John D and Johannes Kepler Renaissance Neoplatonism was marked by preoccupation with restoring ancient wisdom as a foundation for present and future knowledge although its adherents often had divergent and idiosyncratic agendas there was a consistent emphasis on developing a Christian worldview grounded in knowledge of the harmony of God's creation the Renaissance Neoplatonic synthesis of Christianity and ancient philosophy was significantly reinforced by the discovery of the Kabbalah the Jewish esoteric tradition the Kabbalah taught a descending order of creation from the perfection of God to the imperfect material world the letters of the Hebrew alphabet which are also numbers were the basic units of creation the notions of creation by descent and numerical harmonies indicated similarities between the Kabbalah and the ideas of Pythagoras and Plato the correspondences were believed to demonstrate that both traditions shared a common origin i.e. divine revelation to Adam Abraham or Moses Renaissance Christians like Pico della Morellando Dola Johannes Ruchin and Franciscus Georgius looked to the Jewish mystical traditions and their attempts to rediscover the wisdom behind the Hebrew scriptures they also viewed the Kabbalah as the sacred original from which the pagan philosophers derived their knowledge numerous studies have established the importance of Neoplatonism and the Christian Neoplatonic Kabbalah to the intellectual life of the 16th century the lasting effects of this worldview on European thought however are much less clearly understood one area in which Neoplatonic Kabbalistic philosophy can be shown to have shaped future thought in abstraction in descriptive of nature how early neoplatonism could be connected to hebrew kabbalah is seen in the similarities between the ideas of the 6th century philosopher bothius and the fundamental kabbalistic text the sefer yetzira both were popular sources for 16th century Neoplatonism. Bythetius taught that all things do appear to be formed by the reason of numbers, for this was the principal example or pattern in the mind 
of the creator. The belief was supposed to be, and I added supposed to be, supported by Sefer Yetzira, but it is uh, supported by Sefer Yetzira, or the Book of Formation. De and it says that it declared that God created the world through three aspects, the verb to number. He created his world, the cosmos, through three numberings by writing the Sefer, number, the sofar, and the telling, or sipur. For Renaissance Neoplatonist, the view that the number underlies all creation was axiomatic. The success of 16th century mathematicians came from the showing of the correspondences between the observable phenomena and mathematical abstract abstractions such as geometrical figures was proof that number is the basis of the natural world. This served to establish mathematics as the inspirational tool for reading the book of nature, God's second great scripture. Math magic thus became an integral part of natural philosophy, not only for Renaissance Neoplatonists, but also for succeeding generations. How the Neoplatonic Kabbalistic tradition helped to routinize mathematics into the study of nature is illustrated by the analysis of John Dee. So the geometrical Kabbalah of John D. and Johannes Kepler, the Hebrew tradition and the mathematical study of nature or the mathematical study of nature, as I call it, is a book that's like 140 bucks. Now, this is from The New Scientist. Why two geniuses delved into the occult is the title of the article and it's by Amanda Geffler and it says in his latest book Deciphering the Cosmic Number historian of science Arthur Miller investigates the bizarre friendship between quantum physics and Carl Jung. Now, it says that these two geniuses delved into the occult. <laughs> that shows, in my opinion, that they aren't geniuses. It says, uh, read our review of Miller's book. Together, the two great thinkers delved into mysticism numerology and alchemy in their quest to understand the universe for themselves. Miller tells new scientists about his experience writing the book. What drew you to write about the relationship between Carl Jung and Pauli? As a physicist, I was of course aware of Pauli's scientific achievements. Meanwhile, my interest in creative thinking had led me to Jung, almost by accident in the 1980s. I spotted on a library shelf a book that they had co-authored, The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche. This really intrigued me. What did the apparently austere Pauli have to do with Carl Jung? who routinely delved into the occult and whose reputation sometimes suffered for it. Yeah, I'll say. Their book is actually made up of two essays. Jung is on, Jung's is on synchronicity. Nothing unexpected there, but Pauli's was a real eye-opener. He wrote on Johannes Kepler and explored how his scientific achievements 
had to be understood within the times in which he lived. This involved looking into alchemy, mysticism, and religion. Amazingly, he included his own research in this area. This dazzled me, of course. The two sat for hours on end in Young's gothic-like mansion on the shores of Lake Zurich during the fine enjoying the fine foods, drinking vintage wine, and smoking the finest cigars while discussing topics such as physics, whether there is a cosmic number at the root of the universe, to psychology, ESP, UFOs, Armageddon, Jesus, Yahweh, and Polly's dreams. Theirs was a journey into the mind, as Jung puts it, with Polly, he could enter the no man's land between physics and the psychology of the unconscious, the most fascinating yet the darkest hunting ground of our times. Why were two such great scientists drawn to these occult ideas? Even as a boy, Carl Jung found himself drawn to the occult. Yeah, I believe that. This would become the root of his break with Freud. Unlike Freud, Jung was interested in aspects of the unconscious that could not be attributed to an individual's personal development, but delved from the deeper, non-personal realms common to humankind, the collective unconscious whose contents he called archetypes. Jung came to realize that understanding the collective unconscious involved using images and symbols from alchemy and myth. You see, guys, psychology, mathematics, and modern science, quantum physics, and math magic comes directly from Kabbalah. Now, this shows that Copernican cosmology does not go alongside biblical cosmology. It just doesn't fit the biblical, the biblical, excuse me, cosmology that we see written by Moses himself in the Torah or in the prophets or taught by Jesus and the apostles or the early church. I mean, we see in this article that these two men, Carl Jung and uh, Pauli, I can't pronounce his first name, but you know, they turned to, Polly had turned to Young for help in response to a life threatening crisis that he had in 1932. Psychoanalysis with Young led him to believe that alchemy and mysticism were the means to open up his mind and increase his creativity and understand what drove him. It says Young showed Polly that symbols from alchemy were the key to why he had experienced so much angst in discovering the exclusion principle in 1924 and why this angst had to do with his neurosis. Throughout the rest of his life, Polly saw his research through the lens of Young's analytic psychology. This was the case in his work towards CPT symmetry on partly violation and his final crusade with Heisenberg towards a unified field theory of elementary particles. I have shown you all that particle physics is absolutely from the Kabbalah. So it says... Was there any merit in these ideas? The article says this, I believe so, yes. 
Through such ideas, they developed an avenue to begin to understand what the elusive thing called consciousness is. Each believed their own subjects in isolation lacked the tools and ideas to do this. To Pauli, quantum physics was restricted to examining the attributes of atoms as explainable by mathematics or math magic. In this, atoms are treated as dead matter, but in the Kabbalah, atoms are the sparks that were scattered from the god of Kabbalah, Ein Sof, or Satan, and that is exactly what Jung had delved into, and that is exactly what John D. and Johannes Kepler had delved into in Neoplatonic thought. Now, I mean, we are going to be playing and watching a video here in just a minute from The Truth is Stranger Than Fiction, and Will is going to explain exactly what I am explaining to you guys. And then we are going to hear from an expert exactly how the Kabbalah comes from Plato and Neoplatonic thought. I've just got to figure out how to edit the video so that nothing that is said in the final video is going to cause me to get the video taken down or be flagged by YouTube in any kind of way. But you can believe and bet your bottom dollar that the things that I've just shown you are that the Kabbalah and Copernican cosmology and all science literally are one and the same. It is what the Bible calls science falsely so called. Mathematics are real, but they come from the fallen angels. This is fallen angel technology. Now, I'm not talking about adding 1 plus 2 equals 3. But it's, it goes back to what Jesus said about the love of money being the root of all evil. You can't have money without counting. You just can't have it. Therefore... We are going to look 100% at where all of this comes from. And we are going to see for a fact that this science, falsely so-called, comes from witchcraft and magic, black magic, the occult the esoteric and when we talk about math magic or scientism we're talking about things like sacred geometry quantum physics quantum theory quantum mechanics quantum computing things that are broken down into the micro and the macro that's what you have to understand about as above or as above so below. These things, they have the microcosm, which is the absolute smallest to the macrocosm. They believe that everything that is below is the same as above. And they are taking what the Bible says or what Jesus said in the Bible in the Lord's Prayer, you know, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They are taking that 
and twisting it the same way that the devil twists everything. So the occult takes that and says, as above, so below. As in the heavenly realm, so on the earthly realm. They are saying that they mirror one another. Guys, stay tuned because Will from Truth is Stranger Than Fiction is going to be showing a Kabbalist teacher, a rabbi, and then he's going to give his explanation on what this guy says, and he's going to show that Copernican cosmology absolutely comes from Neoplatonic thought and Platonic thought, from Platonism and Pythagoras, and from Babylonian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, known as the Kabbalah. Stay tuned. This is going to be a video you want to watch until the very, very end. Because the final hour of this video is way better than anything that you will have seen so far. You might see clips from some of my other videos, but watch anyway. In ancient times, they called Kabbalah mysticism. But if you tried to explain the computer just even 200 years ago, or the fax machine or the internet, they'd call it mysticism. So Kabbalah spoke about concepts that were literally not just centuries, but even millennia ahead of time. So for example, the Zohar, 2,000 years ago, which is 1,500 years before Columbus, the Zohar spoke about a round earth. To quote, the whole world rolls around like a ball, so that some people are above and some are below. The Zohar said 2,000 years ago that true reality exists in 10 dimensions. Can you imagine? We just learned about dimensions in this century, that there's other dimensions we can't see. So Kabbalah said true reality exists actually in 10 dimensions. Now, why is that important? They said, if you look around with your five senses, we only detect 1% of true reality. The remaining 99% is hidden, says Kabbalah, in these other dimensions. Could you stay a while to share my grief? For it's such a lovely day to have to always feel this way. And the time that I will suffer less is when I never have to wake. Wandering stars for whom it is reserved the blackness of darkness forever wandering stars for whom it is preserved the blackness of darkness forever those who have seen the sign of dread like a husk from which all that was not has fled and the minds that the monsters were Feet above their birthday, wandering stars for whom it is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, wandering stars for whom it is preserved the blackness of darkness forever.
That song is a version of Wandering Star by Portishead, back from the 90s. It's a great song, but it's, it's actually quoting from the book of Jude, as I'm sure some of you recognize. Jude being really the only specific mention of what today we call planets uh, anywhere in the Bible. I believe there is one other reference in the Old Testament, which certain translations uh, render planet, but uh, honestly it's a lot more ambiguous as to whether that's a correct translation or not. But in Jude, Wandering Star is undeniably you know, referring to, that's what the ancients, all the ancient peoples called the planets. And the context of that verse is extremely interesting. Because, of course, in verse 13 of Jude chapter 1, he's talking about ungodly men who've rejected authority and followed the way of Cain. And he makes a number of poetic descriptions, one of which is, uh, they are wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. So he's making an external reference, directly linking the wandering stars with judgment. And it's made that much more interesting being in the book of Jude, which is quotes from the book of Enoch and connects to what it says about the luminaries that did not hold to their assigned their assigned paths and the judgment that was given to them. But why am I talking about all this? Uh, in the past, I've touched upon this in the sense that in Genesis, um, when it's on day four, when the luminaries are created, it only mentions, of course, the sun, moon, and stars. And those are three distinct creations. The sun is clearly not one of the stars, you know, and this is not observational language or whatever kinds of hermeneutic um, contrivances uh, people want to come up with. There are three distinct categories. And of course, the, the planets is not a part of that. They're simply stars, sun, moon, and stars. But what's also noteworthy is that not, it's just the term or mention of, you know, planets missing in the original creation, but this whole concept of, of a, a planetary system, a solar system is nowhere found in the Bible. I mean, in, in the book of Job, it does reference uh, the constellations, you know, and the constellations having names. And so by that, we can infer that, that the constellations were actually a part of the original design. But the idea of these wandering stars being part of a the design and, and comprising this very uh, complex system is never so much as hinted at. And that becomes increasingly significant when you turn and then look into the realm of the occult and mysticism and things like the Kabbalah, because it starts to become very interesting that the planets, that the, the planets long before Galileo or Copernicus or any of the modern conceptions of a solar system were around, the planets were, you know, centuries before any of that came about, were regarded as being part of a system. And like that guy, uh, I think his name is Billy Phillips, he's a Kabbalist teacher, you know, he says that there are ten dimensions, and so when you start to explore how how the Kabbalistic tree of life is essentially one of the things it's supposedly representing is these ten spheres, and these ten, you know, they cor and they correspond to the planets, and, they, and they're also dimensions and they correspond to chakras in the body supposedly and on and on and it's also you know this the system of of gods it is the pantheon of gods which appear in every pagan mythology every pagan pantheon in some form or another and there's you know and there's endless variations depending on you know the chinese system or the the babylonian system or the egyptian system or the norse mythologies or the, the aztec and the maya all these you know, slightly different deities, slightly different, but they all incorporate the planets. And um, and the more you delve into this, the more you see how central it is to all occult cosmologies, all occult belief systems. While the only reference in the Bible is really this one in Jude, and it is one associated with judgment and rebellion and the fallen angels. And I've actually been listening to a number of lectures given by Manly P. Hall, the uh, the famed occultist. He talks a lot about the solar system and the planetary bodies and, you know, the, the ancient connection to the ancient gods and Kabbalah and everything. He, you know, he knew all the different, you know, Mentley P. Hall was, in many ways, was the original progenitor of, of astrotheology in the 20th century, combining Gnosticism and all the, the different occult traditions, shamanic traditions. And basically what Manly P. Hall explains is that according to the ancients, and by ancients he means, you know, the ancient pagan mystery schools, understanding the, the planets, the pantheon, as a, as a system, the significance is that it, it very much does function like a, a, a ladder. The universe was not strange. It was near. It was not terrible. It was tremendous, but not fear-inspiring. It was vast, but this very vastness challenged man to grow rather than 
to surround him with fear. And so enlightened peoples began to reach out in friendliness to the stars. They did not populate the firmament with evil beings, but with great good powers. And they sensed these good powers as forever protective and paternal. They sensed these powers as contributing continuously to the well-being of every creature that existed. And by the time Egyptian civilization had arisen, we see this universe in which we live strangely charted, mysteriously organized into plane levels and spheres and departments. There were worlds within worlds, wheels within wheels, as in the story of Ezekiel's vision. Man saw the universe as a vast structure of evolving life and saw himself moving through this structure. You know, according to any form of Luciferianism, there's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as a rebellion against God. It was simply some kind of a choice that was made back in the, in the distant past to go on this journey, this journey of discovery, this journey of enlightenment. And so man left his original abode in the stars, living with the gods, and came down to the the mortal existence that we now have, and he came down through these planetary levels, these dimensions, these spheres. And so the ultimate goal is to eventually ascend back up through them and uh, go back to where we came from, to return to the stars. And this is what is so interesting once you really start to kind of look at just materialistic Copernican cosmology and what it says, how in so many ways it does seem to be actually preserving these these old pagan mythological concepts in a materialistic form in some way or another, um, in the sense of, you know, we're, we're all star stuff, we came from the stars, you know, there's a materialistic embodiment of that. And then conversely, by going back up through the stars, by, by spreading out and conquering the solar system, you can even think of the planets as being these like stepping stones, these stages of, you know, exploring the cosmos. And it, it is pretty uncanny how it still mirrors so much of the, the, the underlying concepts. And the more I really think about this, the more it makes sense in the, in the way that it, that's really all that, the, that Satan cares about in the end, is the, the embedded teaching within this false belief system versus that false belief system. He doesn't really care whether someone is deceived by atheism or materialism, scientific materialism, or if they're you know, full-blown occultic mysticism, you know, or whatever combination in between. It's all, the net effect is the same. And that's why it's, it's pretty amazing the more you study about Copernican cosmology where you can see these parallels and how with all the changes, it's it's still, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, I think about the analogy of, you know, it doesn't matter, like Satan doesn't care if, you know, if you prefer Harry Potter, you know, or if you prefer Star Wars. Either way, it's the same witchcraft. It's the same Gnostic worldview being preached. You know, he doesn't care whether you like wands or you like lightsabers. You know, it doesn't. It's all the same. You know, it, make, it makes no difference in the end. And again, going back to the, the quote at the beginning, when he's quoting from the Zohar, the Zohar was written in the 13th century, talking about earth, uh, the earth rolls, and there's people on top of it and people on the bottom of it. The Bible never says anything like that. Yet in the Zohar... Which, when you really boil it down, I mean, this it's either a total forgery or what I would say is almost certainly a, it's a demonically inspired book. It's an occult book. It's a doctrine of demons. So we see that we see the origins of all these concepts coming from the mystery schools, coming from mysticism, coming from the occult. And it's continuing to preach the same message of ascension, of returning to the stars, of becoming like gods. That's what transhumanism is. It's the same old Luciferian message. And it's all a lie. The Bible does not teach anything resembling a planetary system, a planetary map. That's what this tree of life is. It's basically the idea. And it makes sense when the original design for the creation, the original purpose of the stars that seem to be administrated by the angelic beings was to serve as a, to mark the times and seasons. That's what it says. So it was a, it was a calendar and it was a map. That was their, the original intention behind the luminaries. And of course, the way Satan takes everything and perverts it and, and spins it and twists it into a Luciferian message. Of course, that's what the luminaries have been turned into this map towards apotheosis, a map for that's what this tree of the Kabbalistic tree of life is. Is it's like a diagram outlining how to navigate your way through the, the planetary spheres, through these dimensions of reality. You know, turning it into a this into a map through Satanism, which is just a labyrinth of lies and dead ends, and you know, leading you to hell.
And so, if you go to Berkeley, where I got my PhD, you can buy a t-shirt which says, in the beginning, God said, the four-dimensional divergence of an anti-symmetric second rank tensor equals zero, and there was light. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the equation for light. The physics is not mathematics, and mathematics is not physics. One helps the other. But you have to have some understanding of the connection of the words with the real world. Mathematical thinking has opened the doors to the exciting adventures of science. Now, the physicist is always interested in the special case. He's never interested in the general case. He does, he's talking about something. When you know what it is you're talking about, that these things are forces, and these are masses, and this is inertia, and this is all, then you can use an awful lot of common sense, seat of the pants feeling about the world. You've seen various things. You know more or less how the phenomenon is going to behave. Well, the poor mathematician, he translates it into equations, and the symbols don't mean anything to him, and he has no guide but precise mathematical rigor and care in the argument. You see, even Richard Feynman admits that applying advanced mathematics to physics is only beneficial if you have a solid grasp of what you are actually referring to in your equations. And this is the whole problem. This is exactly why Copernican cosmology does not fit Biblical cosmology. Because ultimately it is a gross error to assume that we can calculate the physics and the mechanics of the heavenly realms. Okay, brothers and sisters, I need to take just one minute to make a disclaimer for YouTube and for anybody watching so no one gets the wrong idea this next video this last video is the one i was talking about in the beginning and everything that is talked about in this video is not talking about a race an ethnicity or a people group or even a religion it's talking about a specific practice the ancient practice of Kabbalistic mysticism. It's the satanic origins of mysticism and the Kabbalah. The satanic origins of the Kabbalah and the Kabbalistic origins 
of science. It is also 100% for educational purposes only. I neither agree or disagree with what is being said. It is strictly for education and knowledge. I am not promoting anything that is being said. In this video, we are going to be discussing some incredibly serious, horrifying Kabbalah secrets. There's such a lack of understanding about true Kabbalah. I have an expert in Judaism and Kabbalah. His research he has compiled in this is astounding. He has the most knowledge about Kabbalah, I think maybe more than any Gentile of all time, unless there's somebody else out there that I need to be referred to. And it's such a disappointment that so many other people in alt media, so many other people out there that aren't talking about this, aren't talking about Kabbalah. So I appreciate you for being here. Thank you so much. It was a very generous uh, introduction. I hope I can live up to it. So I I've been doing so much reading on related books. Can you think of another expert that's, I mean, besides rabbis, there's hardly ever even really any uh, knowledgeable critics out there that know about Kabbalah. That's that's what I wanted to say in the introduction also. I'm always reading all these other books, and they're always vindicating and validating what you're saying, and I'm seeing clips of rabbis explaining all these things, and, and the fact that you're right about all this. So, you know, so many people, they don't, they hear, they hear the word Kabbalah all the time, but they don't actually understand what it means. Like, if you had 20 seconds to explain to somebody, like, say you grab the microphone and you're on national television, what would you say about Kabbalah that people need to know? Kabbalah is a system of beliefs which derives from the Orphic mythology of the Greeks, from Gnosticism, from Neo-Pythagoreanism, from Pythagoras, from Plato, from Middle Platonic thought, and from Neoplatonism. And I'm going to start to explain that today. And what that really means is it's a system of beliefs as to how the world was created and as how the world should end. It is a cosmology and an eschatology, which primarily derives from Greek beliefs, but it is twisted in a very negative way to try to justify their pre-existing hatred of Gentiles and their pre-existing desire to exterminate Gentiles. So an extermination plan of the Gentiles and the plan to rule the world at the end of the 6,000 years, is some of the origins coming from the Canaanite religion as well? Absolutely, yes. It's yeah. all paganism. Mm -hmm. They uh, largely discard the Torah, except that they look at the Torah as an allegory. Uh, there was a Jew named Philo the Jew of Alexandria, Egypt. And at the time that he lived, which is the lifetime of Christ, Alexandria was the largest Jewish community in the world, larger than Jerusalem, much larger. And it housed most of the Jewish intellectuals. And Philo the Jew incorporated uh, Canaanite religion, the oral traditions of the Jews, and Platonic philosophy in an environment where Neo-Pythagoreanism and Middle Platonism were thriving. And he utilized the Torah as an allegory, just as Jacob and Esau represent Jews and Gentiles. He went through the Torah again and again and said that it was an allegory to these Greek ideas. Ohu and Tikkun is vitally important to what I'm going to be discussing today. It's directly to creation and the destruction of the present world that we live in and the creation of the Gentiles, and the ultimate destruction, annihilation, genocide of the Gentiles. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I wanted to specifically get into Toho and Bohu, Tukun Olam, and then most importantly, the symbolism of the shells and the husks of the Kelly pot, and what that means, and, and what that uh, symbolism, it, the implications of that symbolism are for the non-Jews. But to get there, you have to kind of explain like the whole creation story, you know, summarize it at least uh, 
if you could, where, wherever you want to start off the top of your head. Do you have um, an image of the reverse, the backside of a an American dollar bill? Yeah, it's up. Okay. If you look to your left, you'll see a pyramid. And the capstone on that pyramid is an eye emanating light. I'm going to go back to the Greeks now and back to Alexandria and this climate where we have Neo-Pythagoreanism and Middle Platonism and Philo and explain what all this symbolism means because it relates directly to what you just put up about Tohu, Bohu, and Tikkun Olam. The eye on the top signifies the one, which is known as the monad in Greek and the Ein Sof in Kabbalah you'll notice that it is emanating rays of light. Those are the emanations of the one which produce being. The remainder of the pyramid is produced by the emanations of those rays of lights in a hierarchy of being. Now the one is got several attributes. It is perfect unity, meaning it has no parts. It is not differentiated. It is eternal, meaning that it does not change or exist in temporal time. It is ultimate goodness. It is only good. And it is composed purely of light. And you will notice this pyramid is made of layers. Those layers represent the emanations that pass from the top towards the bottom. Remember that emanation relates to descent down the hierarchy of being. And in the Greek system, the first thing to descend as an emanation is called nous. And that means mind or intelligence, and it contains the logos and the demiurge. The nous then emanates the world soul. And the world soul, the nous, and the one, they are referred to as the hypostases. The proto-theos is the first god, the one. The deuteros theos is the second god, or the nous. And then we have the world soul. The important thing to note right now is that as these emanations pass down towards the bottom, they become further and further differentiated into more and more parts. We see that the one is breaking apart and the light of the one is breaking apart and that will ultimately produce sparks. We also should note that the chain of being then passes from the world soul to the uh, lesser gods below it, the angels and demons below the lesser gods, and then human beings to animals, to plants, to rocks and minerals. And bear in mind that this is a constant descent getting further and further away from God as the emanations proceed down their chain. At the very bottom, at the foundation, we see what the Greeks referred to as matter. Remember the attributes of God. God is eternal. God is unity. God is good. God is light. God is undivided. He exists in eternal time. Matter is exactly the opposite. Now, matter is what the Jews call tohu and bohu in the first paragraph of Genesis. And in the Greek conception, it is a pre-existing substratum, which in and of itself is nothingness, what the Kabbalists would refer to as a non-entity. This matter is pure evil. It is absolute darkness. It is the furthest distance from God that one can get, and it is non-being. And that is the realm of the Gentiles. So the Jews view themselves as the capstone of the pyramid, as the one, and they view Gentiles as matter. 
as non-being, pure darkness, pure evil, ever-changing. And they believe that they can use a kind of a black magic on Gentiles to completely convert them into this matter of nothingness and thereby make them cease to exist. Kabbalah is based almost entirely on this neo-Platonic conception that the one emanates its light and that those emanations continue down the chain of the sephirot. You can see that the um, on the tree of life, those lines going between the sephirah from Keter to Chokhmah to Benah, etc., all the way down to Melkut. And that is the descent of the emanations. Now remember that this descent makes things more divided, more changing, more evil, and further from God. There is an opposite route that goes back up to God. And that is the route which the Greeks referred to as epistrophe. An epistrophe is descent. Now, in uh, Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 19, it discusses Jacob's ladder. Now, as I said, Kabbalah takes the stories of the Old Testament and of the Torah specifically as allegories. And this allegory of Jacob's ladder is the ascent of the angels up and down the ladder to the gates of heaven, as well as the descent down the ladder to the gates of hell. And you'll notice in this picture, again, we have the one as a body of light like the sun emanating its rays of light. And as the emanations proceed downwards, they approach the darkness of matter and they start to separate further and further creating more and more differentiation. And you can see that they break down into sparks and that those sparks become greater in number, less significant and more shrouded in evil darkness as we proceed toward the base of the hierarchy of being. Now the Kabbalists view themselves as wanting to engage in epistrophe. They want the ascent up the ladder towards the one. And Kabbalists practice the old ancient belief of the mystics and in mysticism that there can be an ecstatic reunion with the one. That ecstatic reunion with the one means that the Kabbalists utilize knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to elevate themselves up the ladder the great chain of being, as it's called, the hierarchy of being. And by doing that, they lose their sense of self. It is referred to as the death of the ego, and they become one with the one, not separated from it, not differentiated, not temporal and changing, but the perfection of the one that they refer to as the Ein Sof. And the mystics said that that was an ecstatic um, transcendence that one experiences when they ascend the hierarchy of being through epistrophe. And that is the opposite of emanation. Instead of the light being projected downwards from the one, the Ein Sof, it is the light returning back to its origin, back to the one, so it forms a cycle. And then it becomes what uh, Aristotle referred to as the final cause. It would be the goal of the emanation to ultimately return through epistrophe to the one so that the many are returning to their source. Now, if we go back to the dollar bill, would that be possible? Yes. There's a lot of symbolism there that uh, we can now understand better. If you can go over to the pyramid, at the base of the pyramid, you'll see that it says 1776 in uh, Roman numerals. 
it utilizes Roman numerals because that signifies gematria, because the letters are also numbers, which is the basis of gematria. Anuit Kirptis is composed of 12 letters, signifying the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 12 tribes of Israel and Judah. The um, Novus Ordos Chlorum is New World Order and signifies the world to come. In the world to come, the Jews will have elevated the earth along the hierarchy of being to equal what is in heaven, the throne of God on the seventh heaven on the planet Saturn. So they are going to be making the earth like the planet Saturn. And the method that they will use to do that is to destroy matter and destroy the Gentiles. And I'll get into that in a bit with the shattering of the vessels and how this Greek conception of the hierarchy of being uh, is mutated through Kabbalah into a plan to exterminate Gentiles. If you go over to the part with the eagle and the stars, I can explain that symbolism and how it relates to our story. Yeah. You'll see above the eagle that there are 13 stars. Again, when stars are differentiated like that, it represents the sparks of Kabbalah, the emanations as they proceed down the chain of being and become further and further differentiated and further, further enshrouded in darkness in the shells and husks of the darkness of chaotic matter. Remember that matter is tohu and bohu of Genesis. You'll see that those stars are arranged in the pattern of the Star of David with a star in the center. That star in the center represents the temple in Jerusalem. And the Jews believe that there are six directions or dimensions, north, south, east, west, above, and below. And the Star of David signifies that. But the Star of David is initially the Star of Remphan, and it signifies the planet Saturn. E pluribus unum means out of many one. Now you will recall as we descend, as we emanate from the one down the hierarchy of being, the beings become more differentiated, more particular. They are no longer unity. And at the base of matter, they are infinite. So what this is symbolizing is taking that many, which are the Jews, and restoring them to the unity of the one, which is the Ein Sof. And that is what the Kabbalistic symbolism on the back of the dollar signifies. And it's a good introduction to uh, Kabbalah. And it was Freemasons that put this on the dollar bill, and Freemasonry is based upon Kabbalah and Temple of Solomon and basically Judaism, Judaism themes. If you can get that image, uh, William Blake's painting of Jacob's Ladder again. So again, we see the one emanating light. Going down the hierarchy is emanation. Going up the hierarchy is epistrophe, rising. E. Michael Jones would refer to it as the rising of the logos. That means that the little seeds of the Logos, which contains the divine plan and the forms in the form of Logoi Spermatikoi, which means seeds of the Logos, go down. Now, the way that this is explained uh, in Kabbalah from its roots in Greek philosophy is that as the emanations of light project their light onto the blank substratum, which is chaos and void, the matter referred to as tohu and bohu at the very bottom rung of the chain of being. Those forms which exist as ideal forms in the noose, in the mind of God, which is the first emanation, those little seeds come down 
and give forms that we can perceive that chaotic matter. Now, in Kabbalah, those forms take the form of Jews having different souls from Gentiles. Jews have those little sparks, the Logoi Spermaticoi, within their souls. Their souls contain those sparks of divine light as the differentiated emanations of the Ein Sof. But in Gentiles, those sparks are not contained in their souls. They simply loosely hover over the Gentiles so that the form of the Gentile exists as a phantasm, as a non-being in that chaotic matter. And that is why the Zohar refers to Gentiles as Tohu and Bohu. It means that they are simply reflected shadows and forms that are caused by these sparks of the emanation, but do not contain these sparks. That means that if the Kabbalah through the process of Tikkun Olam can raise those sparks, which hover over the Gentiles, they will free that light and then epistrophe will occur and the light will elevate up the chain of being, up the hierarchy of being, and escape from the Gentiles, who are shells of darkness and who are purely evil. When that happens, those sparks, which gave form and existence to Gentiles, will no longer be in the realm of chaos and void, tohu and bohu. Therefore, the Gentile, whose spark is elevated, will cease to exist and re will resolve back into nothingness. Matter is nothingness. It is pure evil. Now, Adam found some quotes from uh, Schnorr Salman and Josef Yitzhak Schneerson that he asked me to analyze. And this is the basis upon which we should analyze those quotes. Because Schneerson, who was the sixth Rebbe, utilized his Kabbalistic black magic to defeat Gentiles by resolving them back into non-entities. And if we read the precise quotes, we will see that what he is referring to is taking the divine sparks away from Gentiles so that their matter, their tohu and bohu, resolves back into nothingness, because Gentiles are what he calls non-entities, what Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, who forms the basis of Kabbalah, would call nothingness, matter. So this is from a book, someone sent me this on Twitter, An End to Evil, Reshis Goyim Amalek which interesting that, you know, they're saying Amalek is Goyim and they're all evil. The first Hasidic discourse, this was delivered in 1920 by the seventh and final Rebbe Schneerson, right? It was the father or the, the father-in-law of Schneerson, uh, Rebbe Schneerson, the seventh. Father-in-law. Father-in-law, father yeah. So what he says here, he says, Amalek is the first among the nations and in the end he shall be destroyed the root of the seven evil nations, and uh, he, they're, they're separate from. It says, the same is also true, though keeping in mind <clears throat> the distinction between holiness and its opposite, with the or the other side on the tree of life, with regard to the forces of unholiness, which are collectively termed Kelipa. Amalek, per, per, personifying the toughest Kelipa, is the spiritual source and root of all those nations, yet he is distinct from them. So they, all the nations, they say, are basically Amalek or Edom. The conclusion of the above verse, and in the end he shall be destroyed, seem to, seems to imply that the Kelipo of Amalek contends no element that can be salvaged by means of the divine service called Beririum, the sifting and refining of the material by elevating the divine sparks embedded within, within it. The Kelipo of Amalek, so it would appear, cannot be rehabilitated into something positive and thereby brought to a state of rectification, tikkun. 
Rather, the only rectification of Amalek is its utter eradication and destruction. This is hinted at in the verse, and in the end he shall be destroyed. Amalek's consummation is its destruction. Comments? What's that? What that is saying, remember, tikkun is the ascent up the ladder of the hierarchy of being. So by raising the sparks, you are now depriving matter, chaos, of those sparks. So it is the end of Gentiles because the, um, the ideal forms will no longer be presented to matter. So the creation of the Gentiles will be destroyed. And the end times and tikkun is the process, the inversion of emanation. It is ascending the ladder and not descending the ladder. And in that uh, story of Jacob's ladder, the angels are ascending and descending. Descending is falling. So what the Rebbe is calling for is for Gentiles to continue to fall until they are eradicated. Well, at the same time, the earth and the Jews are raised up, ascend the ladder towards the source of the light and become rectified and redeemed in that process as Gentiles are destroyed in that process. And it says that it, they are uh, non-entities in here as well. That is a reference to Gentiles as being what the Greeks called matter, nothingness. Now let's start to get into uh, the cosmology of Kabbalah, and then we'll end up at the eschatology of, cosm of uh, Kabbalah. So we're going to get into the creation myth. And in that cosmology, again, it mirrors the Greeks, that there was a pre-existing chaos and void, which is called tohu and bohu in the Torah. Now, this is a system of pantheism in both the Greek and Kabbalah, because what happens is the Ein Sof, which is the one in the Greek, in the Kabbalistic system, contracts itself. Remember that it is perfect unity, light, eternity, undifferentiated. So in order to create beings, there has to become the particular. There has to become differentiation, a multitude of things. And there has to be a space and a time in which these things can take form and in which they can change. Because again, the one is eternal. There is no change within it. So the Ein Sof, as its first act of love, contracts itself. And this creates an emptiness, a chaos and a void into which it then emanates the first emanation of the tree of life, Keter, Adam Kadmo. And this emanation of light then projects its light to the next emanation, Chokhmah which then projects its light to Bana and so on, all the way down. And it, as it descends, it gets further and further from God. But the Kabbalistic system deviates a little bit from Plotinus's system at this point. And this is all an innovation by Isaac Luria, which is most certainly based on Neoplatonism and the emanation theories of the Gnostics, of the uh, Neo-Pythagoreans and of the uh, Middle and Neoplatonics. Now, what Luria said so that he could get around this idea of this pre-existing chaos, which exists in Genesis and which mirrors the Greek, especially in, um, in Plato's Timaeus, which is the substratum of matter, which is purely evil and um, has no forms until the demiurge takes the forms from the mind of the one and uh, imposes them as light on this darkness to give them forms. Think of it this way. If you take a light and you shine it on this primordial matter, which is chaos, 
these ideal forms which exist in the mind of God take on somewhat corrupted and less ideal forms, but they become something in this darkness, and they turn non-being into being. But if you remove the light, that immediately again returns to darkness. And that's what the Jews want to do to Gentiles. They want to turn off the light that was turned on to this chaotic darkness and restore it back to chaotic darkness for Gentiles. Well, they themselves elevate their sparks back towards higher levels of this emanation. And they also want to lift the world up the level of being so that it matches the seventh heaven and the throne of God on the planet Saturn. So that is why Takun Olam is always talking about elevating the sparks and releasing the divine sparks from the darkness. This is all Greek cosmology. And what they are doing is now they are saying the end times are approaching. So we have to reverse the process of emanation. For the Kabbalists, the angels are no longer going to be walking down Jacob's ladder. They are going to be ascending Jacob's ladder. Now there is a bridge that exists in Kabbalah, which also existed in Plato's Timaeus. Plato called it the great divide between the divine realm where the one and the noose existed, and then the lower realms of the gods and created beings and the intermediary beings going down towards matter. Jacob's ladder is considered a bridge that crosses this great divide. And in Kabbalah, there is a hidden 11th Sephirah known as Dayat. And Dayat means knowledge. So the Kabbalists believe that with knowledge, they can cross over this bridge from the lower seven emanations into the higher three emanations. So we have out of the many returning to the one. And that's vitally important to understand. And again, we have to look to the Torah as an allegory. In the Torah, in the book of Genesis, it states that in the Garden of Eden, Yahweh forbid Adam to eat of the tree of knowledge. And the gods did this because they were afraid that if Adam ate of knowledge, he would be able to use knowledge, Deat, as a bridge across the great divide and therefore ascend up the chain of being and become one of the gods. So the gods were afraid that knowledge can enable human beings who are intermediary beings and lower beings to ascend and become higher beings, to become gods. And one of the attributes of gods is that they are eternal. So knowledge becomes the tree of life, and the Torah is the source of this knowledge, and the Torah is referred to by Kabbalists as the tree of life. And you would think that it would be called the tree of knowledge, but it's not, because knowledge creates divinity and causes one to ascend the hierarchy of being so that it thereby becomes the tree of life. So this is vitally important to understanding the Kabbalistic agenda, because just as the gods tried to prevent mankind from uh, eating of knowledge and gaining dayat so it could cross the bridge over the great divide between the realm of the divine and the realm of the mundane, the Kabbalists tried to prevent Gentiles from gaining knowledge. Because just as Adam was punished with death when he ate or when Eve was tempted and grabbed the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the Kabbalists condemn Gentiles to death for gaining knowledge. In the Babylonian Talmud, Folio 59a, which states that any Gentile who gets the knowledge of the Torah deserves death. 
So again, the Jews are constantly modeling themselves allegorically after what their gods do and the story of the Garden of Eden and forbidding the Gentiles from gaining knowledge drives the Gentiles down the Jacob's ladder towards matter, towards becoming nothingness without knowledge, because that knowledge also helps to create their form. So if they are deprived of knowledge, they will descend down into nothingness. If the Kabbalists consume knowledge and safeguard knowledge, just as their gods did, then they will ascend Jacob's ladder and return to the first one emanating all of the light. This story is repeated in the story of the Tower of Babel. Again, the Tower of Babel is ascending towards a higher state of being and entering into the uh, realm of the one. It becomes Jacob's ladder, allowing uh, all of humanity to ascend to the gods and cross over the great divide. It becomes the bridge, the deat of knowledge. And this, just as it scared the gods that uh, human beings should obtain knowledge, it scared the gods that these human beings bearing axes were going to climb into heaven and become gods and idol worshippers at the peak, at the top of the Tower of Babel. This is very important to understand because uh, we are being persecuted in the exact same way allegorically. Because what the gods did to prevent this unity of humanity at the time, all human beings spoke the same language, which means that they shared their knowledge and they were able to pass along knowledge to one another and to their children so that knowledge would not have to be regained in every generation. In other words, they were allowed to progress up the hierarchy of being, up the chain of being to become gods. And that scared the gods. So what the gods did was they shattered the Tower of Babel, shattered all the knowledge, and lowered human beings down the chain of being back into the realm of matter and material. And at the same time, they made every human being speak a different language so that there could be absolutely no unity among human beings. Remember, unity is an attribute of the one. So they differentiated human beings, stripped them of their knowledge, and stripped them of their ability to communicate with one another and share their knowledge and allow their knowledge to progress, especially from generation to generation. So the Tower of Babel is actually a, rep a repetition of the story of the Garden of Eden, uh, conveying the exact same lessons to the Jews. Now, the Jews view themselves as gods of the earth, just as Yahweh and Shekinah are gods of the heavens. And they want to make the earth as above, so below, and they want to perfect the earth so that the earth rises up the chain of being to heaven. In order to do this, what they do is they atomize Gentiles. They pit Gentiles against one another, which is the same lesson as the Tower of Babel, of creating different languages. And they do this on the internet by creating echo chambers. These echo chambers are the exact same process as the Tower of Babel, where everyone has the potential to speak one language on the internet. They start to ban certain forms of speech and they um, create echo chambers where people searching for information get fed directly back into the same cycle of information that their group is permitted to engage in. But they are not allowed to communicate with others. And this is the process of the Tower of Babel, of differentiating the Gentiles to make them more like evil matter and drive them down the chain of being away from the unity of the one. 
I have a question. Where did you uh, read about these things? The dollar bill and the Tower of Babel? Um, there was a book uh, that I read just recently that was written by, I think, Pharrell and DeHart called Transhumanism. And that book, um, I think they got the chain of being wrong. They inversed it, and they think the lowest level is the highest level, and they made several other mistakes. But it talked about the Tower of Babel and the fact that the Tower of Babel leads into plurality and the division of the one and is utilized by the gods as a means of keeping human beings from progressing. In terms of the dollar bill, those are all my unique insights as far as I know. But it became immediately apparent to me when I um, thoroughly came to understand and read Plotinus's Aeneids. Plotinus wrote uh, six books in the form of nine tractates each. Aeneid means the nines. And in this, Plotinus lays out his um, theories of the hierarchy of being and of the trinity of the one, the noose, and the world soul. And when I pieced that together and I considered Plotinus's conception of matter as nothingness and matter as pure evil, the furthest distant thing from God on the chain of being to the point where it becomes non-being, it all clicked for me. And now I should explain the cosmology of the emanations. So as I said, the Ein Sof contracted itself to create a space for differentiation, for particular things, for a plenitude, a multitude of things to exist, and in which they could uh, change in space and time and reorder themselves. <clears throat> That vacuum that he created is referred to as the Tsim Tsum. And he then projects an emanation of himself into that Tsim Tsum that becomes the Adam Kadmon and the Sephirotic Tree of Life. These emanations are of powerful, um, divine, radiant light. And Isaac Luria introduced matter, the Greek matter, the pure evil, into his system in the form of vessels, which contained this radiant light in the ten sephirah that become the sephirot. So that um, these vessels form a shell, a husk, a container for this light. And the top three containers held but the lower seven containers, which are the lower seven sephirot on the tree of life, shattered. And when these uh, lower seven vessels shattered, they formed the tohu and bohu, which is the primordial chaotic matter of the Greeks. And it was only the sparks of the divine light which scattered when the seven vessels shattered that give any kind of intelligible form to these um, shattered uh, shards, the supernal refuse, as it's called, this garbage of pure evil. The Gentiles remain this garbage of the pure evil. The Jews are the divine sparks and they can free themselves and enter a higher realm of being, but the Gentiles cannot. Because if the Gentiles free the sparks that are attached to them, they descend in back into uh, Tohu and Bohu and become the matter of non-being and nothingness. Now, the Jews, I think in Shabbat, in the Babylonian Talmud, Folio Shabbat, um, Folio 88a or 88b, I think it is, state that as long as there is a single Jew alive who studies the Torah, 
the state of being of the universe will continue to exist. But if every Jew were to abandon the Torah, then all of the knowledge would be lost and the entire world would dissolve and resolve back into tohu and bohu and become nothingness. So that is why the Kabbalists view it as vitally important that they become Jacob in the tents studying the Torah, while Esau is the animal, the darkness, the shells, the caliphate, out in the fields providing the means for sustenance for the Kabbalists to engage in this Torah study. So all of these Greek ideas are utilized as a justification for their pre-existing hatred of Gentiles and their belittlement of Gentiles, because they place Gentiles on the lowest rung of the ladder of being, and they place themselves on the highest rung of the ladder of being as polar opposites. They are the light, they are goodness, they are eternal, they will inherit the world to come. Gentiles are exactly the opposite. Gentiles are pure evil, Gentiles are pure darkness, Gentiles are temporal as opposed to eternal and will cease to exist. And the world to come can only be created by removing the darkness from the present world and elevating the state of being of the present world to the heavenly world. And that entails killing off the Gentiles. Just wanted to uh, show something real quick here. This is the, the Megala 6a. It's the Talmud. It says, es God said to him, Esau is wicked. Isaac said to God, yet will he not learn righteousness? It, just like we read earlier, can Amalek be rehabilitated? They say, there is no one who can find merit in him. God said to him, in the land of uprightness, he will deal wrongfully. So he, he will be, he'll be an idol worshiper in the world to come, and that's not allowed meaning that he is destined to destroy Israel. Isaac said to God, if that is so, that he is that wicked, he will not behold the majesty of the Lord. This concept that, that Esau hates Jacob, we are genetically predisposed to anti-Semitism because we're jealous and mad that, that they stole the birthright. So they believe that, and then at the same time, they also Wait, teach in the I Talmud. Can a few insights into that last passage? Because yes, I think it's significant. Yes. Well, if go you ahead. Back up and show it. He will not behold the majesty of the Lord. That is the ecstatic reunion with the one that the mystics had long before Talmud and Kabbalah came into existence. That is elevation. That is epistrophe, ascent up the to the higher planes and up to this ecstatic reunion with God. Now, Esau cannot rise up the ladder of being. He has to descend because he is composed only of material. In theology, we have three basic theories in Christianity and Judaism, Gnosticism, <coughs> excuse me, and Platonic thought. We have creation ex materia which means that creation is made out of the pre-existing uh, chaotic substance of darkness, which is matter. We have creation ex deo, which means creation from God, which is the emanation theory, that God projects its divine light, and these sparks of light become the Jewish beings. That is pantheism. And then in Christianity, which orthodox, not Gnostic, Gnostic Christianity remain, retains the dualism of ex materia and um, ex deo. But in orthodox Christianity, we have something new, which is creation ex nihilo, which avoids the pantheism of Kabbalah and uh, Gnosticism. And in ex nihilo, God does not create the universe from itself as it does with emanation theories. It simply creates it from nothing. So there is not this chaotic pre-existing matter. 
by the uh, Neopythagoreans of uh, the first century BC to about the second century BC. And they stated that matter is pure evil. And that is the justification that the Jews use for claiming that Esau is pure evil. Because Esau is flesh? How are they, How is Esau, Esau flesh, is but flesh. they're not? Esau is composed ex materia from the original pre-existing chaos of Tohu and Bohu. And, and this is interesting because they're also relating here in the Talmud Esau to Germania, which they believe that, that that's what they believed with um, Germany must perish, is that if they don't eliminate Germany, which they believed was Amalek, they pinned as Amalek, then uh, they will go on to destroy the world. Go. Right. The world will resolve back into Tohu and Bohu. If the Gentiles continue to exist past this 6,000-year limitation the Kabbalists have imposed on themselves to complete the work of Tikkun Olam, of restoring the Holy One. Do you see how it says, Isaac said before the Holy One? Mm -hmm. That equates to the One, the Monad of the Greeks. So they become elevated. Again, we are going from the particular towards the ultimate unity. It is the experience of losing oneself, the death of the ego, abandoning the conception that human Jewish souls are separate. They believe that all of their souls come from what the Greeks called the world soul, which they call um, Shekinah. That is why we see all these um, New Age philosophical systems trying to tell us that we are all one soul and we should unite. That is the root of all these Kabbalistic beliefs, is the Greek conception of the world soul that creates the finite soul, and that we have to be selfless and abandon our sense of individuality and differentiation so that we can experience the orgasmic, ecstatic experiencing of the loss of self and becoming one with the one. And um, can, what does it mean to be cut off and, and the world to come and the shells of darkness? Can you get in a little bit more of that? How is the shells of darkness story meaning the elimination of the Gentiles? The shells of darkness were formed when those 10 vessels were created by the Ein Sof to contain the powerful radiating light of the emanations. The lower seven of those vessels shattered and they created the materia, matter. They created what Kabbalah refers to as kelephot or um, klipot. Those are the shells. That is the chaotic matter, which is pure darkness, the exact opposite of the one, the holy one. It is pure darkness. It is temporal. It is ephemeral. It is constantly changing. And it only takes form when the uh, emanations of the divine sparks shine upon it. But in taking form, it forms shells, husks, which hide the ideal forms and therefore corrupt them and introduce evil to them. So it is the mission of the Jews to separate these divine sparks from the shattered vessels, which uh, turned into shells and husks, concealing these divine sparks and freeing these divine sparks so that they can be elevated and climb up Jacob's ladder towards the gates of heaven. It is the process of creating the ascent. And we have to look at this as a constant cyclical flow. They are constantly driving the Gentiles down because they believe that the Gentiles are demons and shells. They are driving it down uh, the chain of being, the hierarchy of being, towards 
raw matter. Well, they are lifting the um, Kabbalists up the chain of being by freeing the sparks from this matter. And in terms of Greek thought, what they're doing is freeing uh, the emanation through allowing it to have knowledge and allowing it to have wisdom and understanding which elevates the light back to its source. And they drive the Gentiles down by depriving them of knowledge and this light. They are also doing this with transhumanism. And that is, they are feeding us corrupted foods to drive us down the hierarchy of being to become mineral. And they are doing this first by veganism to keep us from eating meat. Recall that the next uh, level down in the hierarchy of being from human beings is animals. So they want to keep us from eating animals. And you are what you eat. So they are practicing alchemy and spiritual alchemy against Gentiles and driving them down. So that when the Gentile diet is deprived of meat, Gentiles descend further down the hierarchy of being towards absolute darkness. They next have corrupted plants with GMOs and fertilizers, which are composed of minerals. So they are now turning plant matter into mineral matter, which drives us further down the chain of being and which corrupts our food source and is driving human beings down the uh, hierarchy of being into minerals. And they are also making meat out of plants, which has been made out of these minerals and which has been genetically modified, which has changed its mineral structure. So all of these attacks on the Gentiles are meant to lower the status of our being down the hierarchy of being into becoming the purity of the Kelephot, which is darkness, and at the same time removing any trace of the light that shines from the sparks that hover above us from us so that we become uh, nothingness. And that is what the Rebbe is referring to when he says that Gentiles are non-entities. And what he's really saying is that the forms of Gentiles are only phantasms, are only ghosts which appear to the Jews but are not real being. And they only appear to the Jews because there are lingering sparks of um, the emanations that are shining on these shells of material, of matter, of darkness. And that if the Jews can elevate those sparks of light through the process of tikkun olam, they can remove that light that is shining on the matter and thereby get rid of these ghosts, these evil spirits that are Gentiles. And Gentiles will just disappear. But in terms of practical Kabbalah, which is like practical magic. They are utilizing their knowledge, their science to do all these things. And the attack is taking the form of the attack of corrupting the diet and the genetics of human beings to make human beings into minerals, which is the lowest level of the chain of being. And they also do this with transhumanism by uh, taking away natural childbirth and creating hybrid cyborg organisms. They are going to combine um, organic matter with silicon matter and with computer chips and things into a new form of being which has no independent will, which has no soul, which has no divine spark of the soul. And remember that the world soul is the third emanation in the divine realm, and it creates the finite souls. So what they are again doing is stripping Gentiles of the emanations of light and driving them down the chain of being into becoming programmable minerals. So what they are doing is forcing uh, genetic, the DNA of Gentiles to be combined with machines into cyborgs, 
which they will say are now superior, but which will be um, programmable and integrated into the singularity. And through the singularity, they will be able to program all of these cyborg robots. And that is the ultimate form that the darkness of the Gentile Esau will become. It will become these robotic slaves of the Kabbalists, and they will have sex slaves, they will have work slaves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They will even have slaves who um, utilize their heightened intelligence through integrated computer systems within their being, which will have no soul and have no independent will to uh, figure out better ways of destroying the Gentiles and performing tikkun olam. It will become an ever escalating, like the birth pangs, an ever escalating series of catastrophes for Gentiles, which in, oh, excuse me, which in turn elevates the Jews. You mentioned science. It doesn't the Vilna of, is it Vilna of Gaon? Is that how you say it? Gaon. It Gaon. Genius. It's genius. Uh, Hebrew for genius. Didn't he say that um, something about like the 600 or the 999 steps to Moshiach will be Moshiach ben Yosef of science or something like that? Yes, it's all um, Moshiach ben Yosef will take the form of science, which again is the idea that knowledge makes human beings like the gods and elevates them up the chain of being. So this is already enabling the Kabbalists to breed um, their 600,000 twin souls in new androgynous bodies. The Jews believe that Adam Ahelion, their Adam, which is different from Adam Belial, which is the material satanic um, Samael and Satan, creator of the Gentiles, they have God as their creator and they are uh, the result of the emanations of the light. They believe that there were 600,000 souls in Adam that composed all of the souls of the Jews. Now, this is repeated in the Torah in many places, especially in the story of the Exodus, where Moses takes 600 Jewish males out of Egypt. Those 600 Jewish males that he took out of Egypt are the half souls of the 600,000 Jewish twin souls that were contained in Adam. The Jews believe that they have to return themselves to androgynes because they believe that the unity, remember the one, the unity is perfection, is only attained when male and female are one, in one androgynous form. And in their gods, that takes the form of the reuniting of the male god Yahweh with the female goddess Shekinah in the temple when they will have sex again, when the temple is rebuilt and these 600,000 Jews are restored to Israel. This is vitally important for people to understand, especially Jews at this point, because those 600,000 are all going to be produced out of men. The Kabbalists have figured out ways of turning skin cells into eggs, and they are going to make eggs out of Jewish men and then take Jewish men's sperm to create these androgynous beings in laboratories. And they already have the technology to do this. They've already created, um, they have created artificial wombs and artificial means of generating human beings out of the skin cells. And this can potentially be done from a single male. They view the Messiah as being the representation of Adam, and the Messiah contains within him all the 600,000 souls of the Jews. So it is possible that Kabbalists are going to completely exterminate all of humanity, including every single Jew except the Messiah, and then they are going to create their immortal transhuman 600,000 Jews out of the cells of a single Jewish male who will be the Jewish Messiah. And that's also very similar to the story of Noah, where Noah's family created the entire population of humanity. And I suspect that's exactly where this is headed. And the Jews had better take note of this and take it as seriously as the Gentiles, because this is where it's headed. 
They want to eliminate all of humanity except for 600,000 androgynous abominations that they are going to use to populate the nation of Israel. These 600,000 abominations will be composed either of 600,000 Jewish males or of a single Jewish male, and no DNA from Jewish females will be utilized in the process. So Jews better think over that. If you think you are going to survive into a new world where you will have this glorious utopia and reign over 2,800 uh, Gentile slaves, you are sadly mistaken. They are going to kill you as well. And another little bit of information I'd like to give to the Jewish community, especially the Kabbalists who are plotting the destruction.